What I'm going to be talking about today is um, really more focusing on addiction as a central brain process and, and how uh, some of us are working to systematize the treatment of the illness. Now, I don't know how it is in the UK and some of the other countries that are here with us today, but in the United States, addiction is treated in a kind of a hodgepodge, catch as you can, go to one place, you get this type of care, go to another place, you get that, this, that type of care. And there's a huge movement going along in the United States, primarily by um, a group of us uh, and, and the American Society of Addiction Medicine being a part of that, to create a, system, a systematic approach to the illness. The problem with that is, is that addiction is a complex disease and it shows up in different ways in different people. And because one, we can develop addiction to multiple different substances, including food, as well as certain behaviors, it creates a, a widely varying kind of platform. Uh, so it, it's almost like we're treating um, multiple diseases with one approach. But today I'm gonna to describe to you briefly why that makes sense. And then I'm gonna to talk to you about one particular approach, which is called recovery mind training. How many of you were here yesterday? Okay, great, a lot of you. So I'm gonna go over a little bit of what we did yesterday for the pe people that were not here, and then we're gonna talk about the actual treatment process. So I always give out my disclosures so that you know my prejudices and biases, okay? It's really just being fair. Um, I do have a salary from a company that, from a company I work with called the Georgia, uh, uh, what is it called? Oh, the Georgia Professionals Health Program. <laughs> I leave the country and I forget where I work, right? <laughs> so what that is is a not-for-profit organization that deals with physicians who have substance use disorder. This is a problem that the United States, I'm proud to say, has done a good job with, unlike most of the other things we do. Um, and the Professionals Health Program in Georgia uh, makes sure that physicians who develop addiction disorders are properly treated, humanely, and that they all get back to work and that the public is safe simultaneously. And the way we do this is the way all addiction care should be. Addiction is a chronic disease. In its natural form, people have periods of remission and relapse. And that goes on unless it's treated. If it's well treated, the, the relapses go down, 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 and in some cases to zero. And if a relapse occurs, it's considered part of the process of the illness, the patient is reevaluated, and proper care is applied. And that's what we do. We oversee that kind of care so that if you ever come to Georgia and you get sick, you know that the physician that cares for you um, is safe to practice medicine in regard to their substance use disorder. And we also deal with uh, other psychiatric conditions as well. I have a small uh, consulting firm. Um, I have stock in a company that's called Dynamicare Health, and the reason I'm saying that is it's a particular uh, type of treatment that's done um, uh, in a telehealth platform. I'm not going to talk about that at all today. Importantly, I need to let you know that I, well, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today comes from two books, okay? And I'm not trying to sell you the books, but I want to be clear with you that the books are the compendium of the, de of the work that we've done over 20 years in developing a systematic way of treating addiction. So, <laughs> so, but you know, I, I, and, and that's just only to be fair, right? I also have two non-financial biases which are important. Um, I'm the immediate past president of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. That is the, in, in the United States, that's the specialty society that deals with physicians and uh, psychologists to some degree and some social workers as well are in that organization. And we are, uh, uh, we deal with the physician's role in the care of patients that have addiction disorders. And I'm also the past president of the Federation of State Physician Health Programs, which is that it's the amalgam of all of these state programs. So just so you know the biases. Okay, get that, we got that aside. So how I got to this place of thinking about what we call today recovery mind training came from listening to my patients. And my patients over 37 years of doing this, have said some amazing things. Some things that on the surface almost seem unbelievable, such as an addict alone is in bad company. 
Or an alcoholic at home alone is behind enemy lines. A great phrase, right? Or one of my favorite, and this is from a comedian by the name of Mark Lundholm, who's in recovery and talks about his recovery. First thought's wrong. Well, what does that mean? Or I'll tell you another longer quote here. This is a quote, an actual quote from a patient who had an alcohol use disorder. He said, it slowly dawned on me that my daily alcohol use was a problem. I decided I would muster my strength and to fight my compulsion to drink. I made a commitment to, to myself that I would abstain completely. I was able to do so for brief periods of time. Inevitably, my hard fought abstinence would collapse into binge drinking, something new to me. So the minute he fought, the illness fought back. The harder I fought, the worse it got. Once the inevitable binge erupted, each fall into oblivion became more ferocious and self-destructive than the last. And this is what got my attention. He said, something was trying to kill me. Now, how do you describe that? You know, at first you could say, well, oh, you know, this is someone that's, you know, prone towards exaggeration or something like that. But over time, I would hear something similar from many of my other patients. So what we decided to do was take a look at the illness from that vantage point. And I would say, what if these people are describing something that's real? What if they're describing something that's actually happening in the brain? And you've heard other metaphors for this. Uh, you've heard the, the red dog, blue dog that um, the Bitten talks a lot about. You heard, saw the gremlin earlier today. But it's important for you to think with me for a second that maybe those metaphors are more than metaphors. Maybe what's happening in the brain is it's fighting against its host. It's like you have this thing in your head which is trying to kill you. So why would that occur? Well, we know, let's talk about the physiology behind that. We know that lots of substances change the level of a very important chemical in an area of the brain called the mesolimbic dopamine pathway. This is an old, old set of neuronal structures. They've been in existence uh, really since the late reptilian kinds of people, kinds of animals, and have existed all the way up into mammals. This dopamine pathway mediates important, very important things for survival. It mediates fight or flight reactions. It mediates uh, food foraging and hunger, it mediates thirst, it mediates child rearing, and it re mediates self-protection. When you ever you are startled and all of a sudden you <clears throat> like that, that is your mesolimbic dopamine reward pathway activating in you. And not surprisingly, in case because of the lecture, it has something to do with addiction. Well, how does that happen? Well, it turns out that Addictive substances change the level of a critical compound in the brain, a critical neurotransmitter called dopamine, which occurs in various parts of the brain. But in this area of the brain, the dopamine activates you and creates a sense, what we used to think of as reward. Actually, that's wrong, and I'll get to a little bit of that in a minute. And all addictive substances create a, a spike in the level of dopamine in this mesolimbic reward system. So here you see nicotine, which creates a spike uh, a percentage of the basal release of 2.5 times with nicotine. Is my microphone working? Yeah. Okay, because now all of a sudden I'm hearing more of myself, which is somewhat annoying. Okay, <laughs> if you administer alcohol, the, the ethanol, uh, ethanol creates a, uh, a, a two-fold increase. If you administer morphine, the, this mesolimbic dopamine pathway gives a squirt of dopamine that's two times as high. If you create cocaine, it creates a fourfold high, fourfold elevation. So that's all of the drugs of abuse, right? And if a drug is abusable, it does this, okay? So uh, this is so important that now when they do a lot of the work in, in uh, medication development, from your pharmaceutical companies, if they want to find out whether this drug is going to be abusable down the road, one of the first things they do is get a bunch of rats 
squirt the drug into the bloodstream and measure the mesolimbic dopamine reward pathway. And if it goes up, they go, oh, geez, this is going to be a, a drug which is going to produce addiction. Now, I'm not sure that stops them all the time, but whatever. <laughs> OK, so that's all of the substances. But other things do that, too. So how about food? Well, food causes at, at least a one and a half time boost, temporary boost in the level of dopamine, especially, by the way, when correlated with the state of starvation or satiation of that animal before the administration. And our favorite friend, sex, does the same thing. Sex is rewarding in the same way that drugs of abuse are. That's why some people who seem to have some propensity for sexual compulsivity, that's how that's mediated. So there is a central theme here that's happening in this very primitive area of the brain. That mediates all of the addiction disorders. Now, we know so much about this uh, that this is uh, from 2005. This is now 15, 16 years old, 17 years old. The uh, Surgeon General's report in 2005, based on the work of a phenomenal research, group of researchers led by primarily Eric Nessler, we not only know that that happens, we know how that happens in this area of the brain. This is a mesolimbic dopamine, uh, this pointer doesn't work. On, on your left, the mesolimbic dopamine reward system is divided into these two areas, the ventral tegmental area, and on the right is the nucleus accumbens. And I'll show you, I think I might have another picture of this later. But we know exactly how each of these drugs modulate this different areas of the brain. This is not kind of soft science anymore. We know exactly how it happens. And we know, if you look at the diagram, we know that some of these substances change the dynamics of this area in multiple different neurotransmitter areas and in multiple different ways. So there you see up in the upper left, alcohol. You also see alcohol uh, on the interneuron in the middle for the GABA, gabaminobutyric acid interneuron. Nicotine activates that dopamine uh, neuron in the uh, ventral tegmental area, it projects to the nucleus accumbens, and that directs the individual. That says something important happened. Okay, so that is the kind of central concept or central process that it seems to occur for all addictive processes. And as we saw, saw earlier, food is one of them. What we don't understand is why some people are susceptible to food addiction and some aren't. That's really going to take probably decades to sort out. But we're heading in the right direction. So what happens when this pathway gets activated? And yesterday I showed you diagrams of the brain. I don't know if I have one. Today I'm just going to show you a diagram of what happens. And again, my pointers aren't going to work, so I'm going to have to just walk you through it a little bit. If there's a substance used, and put in your head food if you choose to do that, or nicotine if you choose to do that, or sex, or gambling, by the way. Gambling is a highly addictive process for some people and other people. You know, I've been to Las Vegas a couple times. I put a quarter in the machine. I go, this is stupid. But it just doesn't seem to ring with me. But unfortunately, other things did, right? OK. So if we have the substance used in the middle, the top middle, the drug use, the immediate effect is pleasure, and it was used, what we used to think of is that the pleasure was what drove subsequent usage, but that's not it. The pleasure is, in fact, a side effect of that process. What really happens in careful work by Kent Berridge et al. Uh, in, uh, at University of Michigan, he was able to parse out the difference between pleasure and what's called signal salience. Signal salience activates certain areas of the brain to do certain things. The first is the middle pathway that goes directly to the left of signal, sa signal salience to you. It creates this memory consolidation. And what happens with that, if you have a substance use disorder and you're early on in your use, something happens where you say, your brain says, oh my god, I'm going to remember this. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Because if, if we're hunter-gatherers, when we have to are barely surviving, and we happen upon a patch of, of wonderful carbohydrate-rich berries, and we eat these succulent berries, which are a total surprise to us because sweet things are a very rare thing to a hunter-gatherer. 
Suddenly we know that event and we also record exactly how we got there, which path we took through the woods, which, you know, how we turned left at that bush, who we were eating those berries with. Does this sound familiar? No. All right. That creates memory consolidation and the reason for that is survival. It also does something which is even more important, which it, it changes the motivational circuits. It says, this is important, remember this, you want to do it again. And the animals of the early Homo sapiens who were able to acquire high caloric foodstuffs survived and evolved through the gene pool to become who we are today. So the better you got at remembering those uh, mesolimbic dopamine reward system activations, the higher the probability you and your progeny would survive. And Homo sapiens today is a byproduct of that. So what happens with those signal in that diagram, and we're not going to go through all this. We did some of this yesterday. But this, this pathway activates a whole plethora of brain areas. Uh, in the, uh, let's go off to the left to look at motivation and drive. I talked to you about signal salience. The signal salience creates a motivation to repeat the process. So if it was successful, you say, I want to do that again, and you wind up subtly rearranging your worldview so that you do that again. You are motivated to do that. So if, if the choices are to go out with a movie for fr with friends, or to snort a line of cocaine with your other friends, all of a sudden you say, no contest. Motivation and drive. You're, you're motivated to repeat that. And the, remember, this is all unconscious. The inhibitory control over this behavior is turned down. And in fact, people that are have, in the middle of a, of a substance use disorder, including food disorders, lose inhibition about a lot of things, for that, we don't know why that is, but they can't say, they can't kind of, a lot of the, so, so let's say I was up here and I was in the middle of an alcohol use disorder binge. Part of my brain would be saying, when are you going to have a drink? Get off that stage. What, why are you talking to those people? Right? How disruptive to your daily life that is. And it becomes unconscious and automated. There's also this reward salience in the upper right. We already talked about that signal salience, right? And by the way, uh, you see in the, the little um, arrow, just for you, for you that are not anatomically you know, motivated. So if I took my brain and sliced it, oh, wrong way. If I took my brain and sliced it in half and took off this half of the brain, the very center, deeper parts of the, of the brain, right here at the brain stem, coming down off the bottom, is this primitive area. And you see NAC, which is your nucleus accumbens, and this is, just to confuse you, VP stands for ventral pallidum, which is the same as a ventral tegmental area. You know, neuroanatomists like to have long Latin names so that no one understands what they do. All right, so the other thing that happens is this activation of memory and learning. The memory is, Twofold. First of all, it sends signals to the hippocampus that says, this is important, remember it. And then it sends signals to the amygdala where your emotional tone is and, sa and sends, says, wow, this is where the pleasure comes in. Okay? So all those together comprise what we now, what I am calling today Attic brain. Attic brain is this thing that what happens to someone when they get in the middle of addiction is they can't control themselves in certain areas. They might seem like they're with you, but their head is someplace else, almost constantly from the moment they get up until they go to sleep. And it's, it's at least partially unconscious. So my patients would say things to me like, I'd say, well, how did you relapse? And they would say, I just found myself in a bar with a beer in my hand. And I'd say, OK, but how did you get to the bar? And they go, I don't know. I mean, I guess I drove, right? Do you see what happens with that, that subtle 
shift in that. It's automatic behaviors. Now, we know a lot about functional neuroanatomy, so I wanted to show you a couple more slides of functional neuroanatomy so that you could study them carefully with me now. So this is the male, this is a joke, okay? So <laughs> I want to be clear, but it's pretty accurate about men, right? You know, the sex, more sex areas, you know. And then my favorite's the commitment particle right there in the center. <laughs> and maybe we should be fair and have the female brain. <laughs> And just so I insult just about every important thing in our lives, we're going to talk about dogs. The beer drinking is kind of a joke, but other ones are the obey particles uh, again. Okay. I wish that we could actually do this with, uh, with our human brain, but obviously it's much more complex. Okay, so let's get, go back to the serious stuff. A laugh helps after you do, deal with all that serious neuroanatomy, right? So, I'm postulating with you today that addiction creates specifically and seemingly immutable changes in brain behaviors. Large life goals are diverted from their ge genetically embedded norms. So, parents will quit taking care of their children. When you look at that from the outside, you say, oh my God, that's horrible. Well, it's because suddenly what they're doing around their addiction is more important. Inhibitory controls are suppressed, as we talked about. Attention to addiction behaviors is an, uh, accentuated. Motivational circuits are hijacked, shifting from healthy pursuits to addiction behaviors. Craving circuits are heightened and misaligned to substances. So if you say to someone who uh, has an addiction disorder, well, what, what, let's, go, let's go to the museum and look at some great art. I know you love Picasso. That person, when they're in the middle of addiction, would say, yeah, I used to, right? Because their whole world view shifts. So that's what I'm saying when I say, when we take, uh, take all of those and lump them in together, and there's a lot of different ways in which behavior changes, and that's why it's seemingly confusing until you put them together. That's why we call that addict brain, okay? So when I teach patients about this, You'll find this is also true about uh, uh, recovery mind training, is that you have to have really clear language because patients who have this illness, I don't care if it's to food, sex, gambling, drugs, alcohol, they're all totally flummoxed by their illness. So the clearer you are in your language, the more you can create a path forward. So I teach them to say, Oh, well, that was, sounds like that was your addict brain telling you to do that. And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was not me. It also differentiates the me from the illness. Critical, right? Because when people have an addiction disorder, they feel uh, fundamentally flawed. This isn't like, I did a few bad things. Their shame is deep, and they feel like, they're just not good human beings, or they're probably more like they're awful human beings. So in order to have this attic brain piece, we had to come up with the alternative. This is the way we want people to head, the direction we want them to head. And we call that recovery mind. Recovery mind is a state of learning how to deal with your illness in a way which is compassionate, self-compassionate, fair, balanced, and measurable. Okay. Everyone with me so far? Okay. So the rest of this talk is I'm going to talk about recovery mind training and how that works, okay? And just, it gets a little easier. We're done with the, the tough neurophysiology, the weirdness of this concept that 
somehow some guy's brain is working against him. But over the years, I found that to be really helpful. It's helpful for my patients. I, I, I will often say, it sounds like a part of you was trying to kill you. And they'll look at me and they'll say, yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. So these are radical concepts. You might even think I'm being overstated. But over the years, I found that the more clear you can be and the more precise you can be, a gentler approach just really doesn't work. It's important for those of you that are in recovery here or know this concept of what recovery is. Recovery mind is not recovery. Those are two different things. Recovery mind is a place, is a way of having your brain be so you can enter and stay in this process of cold recovery. It doesn't eliminate a, uh, traditional treatment. It reorganizes it into packets uh, that focused on specific brain changes. So each of these different changes in the brain functioning are addressed systematically with psychotherapeutic techniques. We steal for, liberally from cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, 12-step recovery programs, wherever we can get it. There's a hodgepodge of interventional techniques, but they're all aimed at specific changes. And it allows, by the way, this is really important because each patient is different. That's what I've learned over the years. The problem with our treatment is our treatment is kind of a, you funnel people in the inside and they go out the opposite side, especially traditional addiction treatment. And that really doesn't work. Instead, you need to adapt the, the treatment to the patient. And you can actually do that within an organized treatment setting if you're clever. The other concept here is that the process of addiction recovery is at its core a learning process. It's not your bad trying to get good. It's a, it's a type of learning. And it's important to know that this type of learning is what's called procedural learning. You learn how versus what. So if you're doing relapse prevention training and an individual says in your treatment process says, well, I, I, can't, I can't walk into my basement because that's where I drank alcohol. You say, okay, let's put the alcohol, let's put that bench in front of us and let's have you walk through that. And you actually walk through that in an experiential fashion versus saying, let's talk about it. That creates a procedural image in the unconscious part of the brain versus a conscious thought of, I'm going to be able to take care of this next time I walk into my basement. We've got lots of recovery skills in recovery mind training. That's why the book is 400 pages. Um, and it really focuses on addiction and illness itself. Now, importantly, for those of us that work in the field, people with addiction disorders often have lots of other issues going on in their life. Recovery Mind Training does not address those, but it, do, it says those have to be dealt with. A large percentage of people with addiction disorders have depression as an illness. A large percentage of people with addiction disorders have, have trauma in their life, childhood trauma, adult trauma. I can't tell you how many, because I work with physicians, when I have a physician that has been, for instance, in the Iraqi conflict and has had a difficult time we screen all of those folks when they come back for addiction disorders because trauma induces addiction. It may be that they had the proclivity towards it when they went into the theater, but what they saw brought it forth. So you actually have to deal with these other illnesses simultaneously. And that's another it's subject of a lot different talk. Okay. So, these recovery skills are acquired, they're practiced in treatment. If you want to teach people how to, for instance, how to, if they have social anxiety and you need them to learn how to go to support group meetings, you actually mock have a support group meeting within the treatment setting. So it's obviously best done in group settings, but it can be done individually as well. And they're divided into these six domains. And this is getting into the weeds, I know. So I'll probably try to move through this pretty quickly uh, so I can tell you about these. So each of the domains are not in it particularly uh, in a timeline order with the ex exception of the first domain, which is containment. 
One of the things we've learned about all addiction behaviors is people don't get better until they stop the addiction behavior. You know, at the turn of the century, turn of the 19th or 20th century, psychiatry throughout the world was interested in addiction disorders to some degree. But sometime around there, they gave up on it. Why? Because those blankety blank patients, I was about to use a curse word, those patients just wouldn't listen to me. Right? And the reason they weren't listened to them was because they were more wrapped up in their illness than going to see their analyst or their other therapist. Right? And what that teaches us, really what we learned about addiction comes from a self-help group called Alcoholics Anonymous that said, first things first. In order to get better, you have to stop the addiction behavior. And the growth comes after you stop. So you have to set up a system of how you stop. How do you do that? Well, if you have a food disorder, you figure out how to have healthy eating. And then you begin to understand how the illness is interdigitated into your psyche. If you have an alcohol use disorder, you somehow figure out how to get that individual to stop. And some people, you can do that in an outpatient setting. I had, I'll tell you a story about a lawyer who came to me once, a very, very well, well thought of lawyer. I'm, I guess that might be a little bit of an oxymoron, but whatever. Uh, and um, he came to see me and he said, yeah, I'm, I think I need to go to treatment and that sort of thing. And I said, well, I said, uh, okay, so you have an alcohol problem. He described his alcohol problem. It was quite severe. I said, have you ever been able to stop? He said, yeah, I can stop for a period of time. I said, well, if you see me once a week, can you stop? He said, yeah, but I'm not going to stay stopped. I know that. I said, okay, so let's go at this week by week. And, and if you stay stopped, then the treatment will work. If you can't stop drinking, then I have to send you away to a place, either an outpatient program in the United States or a residential program, whatever. And he looked at me like I thought I had three heads. He said, yeah, but I'm not going to stay stopped. And I said, well, let's worry about that when we come to it. And what we did is through a series of contracts with my, myself, his wife, and for a period of time he was on antibuse, and he's still in recovery today, doing fine. Other people will walk in the door and they'll say, yeah, I should be able to stop, and Katie bar the doors. It ain't going to happen, right? Those people need to somehow have a behavioral intervention to stop them. And that's also true for other things. Sexual addiction, internet addiction, porn addiction, cocaine addiction, whatever, heroin addiction. You have to, the, 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 behave, the addiction behavior itself has to stop first. That's the rule of thumb in all addictions. And there are ways that sometimes you can get people to cut down a little bit. I've had folks that have had food addiction disorders where they were able to start controlling it for a little bit in outpatient setting and we were able to get things going, set up a safe home for them, safe food, and they were able to contain the illness. So that's the first step. And if you've ever been frustrated by the fact that people that have addiction disorders just seem recalcitrant, it's because you haven't said first things first. You got to stop the behavior first. We call that containment. Now, what happens, it's intense at first and often multifocal. What we do with our physicians, by the way, is we drug screen them for five years. And at first they hate the drug screens, and by the time they leave, they say, I think I want to keep these going. It just kind of keeps me from thinking about ever using again. So at first it's painful. At first they think you are the devil incarnate. And over time they say, thank you for saving my life. So being firm, finding out what works for each person, and if it doesn't work within the system you've got, send them out. So there are different types of containment. There's physical containment. You lock someone up in an inpatient center. There's social containment. You set up expectations, whether that's expectations in the home, or again, in the United States, what we use a lot is what's called a therapeutic milieu. Each of the people within that therapy, within that outpatient center or that residential center are responsible for each other's maintenance of remission. And by doing so, they learn a little bit about themselves. Contractual, signing off on drug screening, that's what we have with the physicians. And biological containment is things like use of antibuse. Okay, so that's the first part. 
The next domain is, are really basic recovery skills. And for folks that uh, have some types of addiction disorders, there are support group meetings. Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. We have Cocaine Anonymous in the United States. We have Crystal Meth Anonymous in the United States. You have it here, too. If you haven't been to one of these meetings, please go. It's pretty cool. There are also, in the United States, and I don't know if this is true here, there are various types of food addiction groups, anonymous groups, that meet together. And, there's, uh, and those groups also create some type of a social contractual arrangement. They teach people to shift from focus on the food to fi figuring out to focus on recovery. That's at the bottom, you see in your list, what we call 12-step work. But there are also some other things that we do. Teach people daily reflection skills. Wake up in the morning and in the evening, figure out what's happening in your day. Teach them mindfulness meditation. The cheapest, most effective, singular tool for health. 10, 15 minutes a day, if you don't know how to meditate yet, learn how. And then you teach your patients how. It induces a sense of calm, it decreases that impulsivity, it produces a sense of well-being that is free. Best deal there is in mental health today. So the next piece is about emotional awareness. And everyone's different in this regard with our relationship with emotion. I love this quote uh, by uh, uh, Tony Damasio. He says, emotions are the complex reactions the body has to certain stimuli. When we are afraid of something, our heart begins to race, our mouth becomes dry, our skin turns pale, and our muscles contract. This emotional reaction occurs automatically and unconsciously. However, feelings are what occur when we become aware in our brain of such physical changes. Only then do we experience, this, experience fear. How do we know this is true? There's really cool research on this. The one research I, I always, often tell people about is, um, is the effect of, uh, uh, of it's tetrodotoxin, what, uh, uh, Botox. When you take people and you give repeated Botox, first thing that happens is they, they lose their ability to be emotionally aware of others around them. It's not huge, but it's significant. And that's because when I smile, people around me smile back. And it's, that smile is infectious. And when I see someone smile, I smile back and I say, oh, he's smiling at me. And if I can't smile, I can't feel. The next thing that happens with people that have a lot of Botox is they lose contact with their own feeling states. And there are people on this planet that don't, do not know their feelings. The state is called alexithymia. It's one of the most helpful concepts in psychotherapy. No surprise here, men tend to have more problems with alexithymia than women, right? That's supposed to, supposed to be funny, but it didn't work, okay. <laughs> so, alex, so if you have someone that has alexithymia, or, and it's a, a gradation scale, it's, a, from the, it's from the University of Toronto, great uh, phenomenon that every therapist should know about. Because as a therapist, I've had people before I understood alexithymia, I'd say, why is this person not upset about that? And then all of a sudden I realized, they're not upset about anything. And I'd say, well, they don't have feelings. Well, it's not they don't have feelings, they can't recognize them. And when you don't recognize them, you can't act in a positive way around you. So that's one half of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum, we have people whose feelings are like a little rowboat on a tidal wave. And their feelings are going up and down and up and down, and they can't they have zero control over them. And most of us are somewhere in between. So part of getting better is learning how to become friends with your feelings. What you do in uh, this domain is you deal with the ability to recognize emotions, especially if you can't recognize them, and to learn how to auto-regulate. 
That's where things like dialectical behavioral therapy comes in. Those types of tools are very powerful in helping people adjust to their affective state because feelings tend to drive relapse. And when you become less overwhelmed by your feelings, you're more effective in the world and you're happier. And for the alexithymics, when you become familiar with your feelings, you say, wow, my wife loves me. Versus, yeah, I, I think, yeah, she, she seems to have stuck with me. I've had patients that do that. Well, so your wife's been with you through all this. What do you think about that? Well, I, I, it's amazing, isn't it? And you go, uh, okay, this, is, this person has a little leg of alexithymia, right? Okay. Okay, the next piece and is, uh, how much time do I have left? I lost my, 10 minutes? Okay, I'm gonna zoom quick then. I'll go through these really quickly. The next is an internal narrative. As I said earlier, everyone that has an addiction disorder, there's something about this primitive drive in addiction which alters self-concept in a very fundamental way. And in the way, the best way of explaining it quickly is to say it deepens a sense of shame about self. Everyone that has an addiction disorder, just about, has this shame, and shame is, not, is out of contact with reality. Yeah, you might have done some terrible things when you're in the middle of your addiction, but you're not a terrible person. And they can't differentiate those things. So getting at the internal narrative, how that's constructed in each person's brain is critical, and there are very concrete steps to do that. Addiction is also a disease of isolation. People that have addiction disorders are isolated, alone, lonely, and they don't know how to connect with others. If they have really severe addiction, they see others as tools to get more drugs or alcohol. That's not connectedness. That's usurpiousness, being usurpious, whatever. Okay. So learning how to do that again is part of that, and part of that is a sense of spirituality, a connection to higher goals in life. And finally, in the pragmatic side, is relapse prevention. Recovery Mind Training has really pragmatic skills you learn. How do you deal with situations? You catalog the high-risk situations in your life. You figure out what you're going to do about them ahead of time. And you role play how you're going to react. OK. So you see in the book, there's some, I don't know how many skills there are. There's just a lot of them. Uh, you're, when you evaluate a patient, you create a list of tasks to be completed. And you realize you're not going to be able to do all of them. So you figure out how to prioritize which ones are difficult. The first five times you do it, it's hard. After that, it comes within a few minutes. If someone's really ill in their illness, you're going to spend a lot of time on domains, one, uh, domains A and B. As time goes along, you're going to move them through process. And that, might, that therapeutic process goes on, should go on, because remember, this is a chronic disease, for proper care should go on over years. OK. So the last thing I'm going to show you is uh, the last thing that recovery mind training tries to be is it tries to be interactive with the patient and concrete. One of the problems over 35 years of dealing with patients with addiction is that they'd say, how am I doing? And I'd say, you're doing OK. And they'd say, well, what does that mean? And I would say, I don't know. I just kind of made it up. Right? It's really hard to figure out that out. So what we did is created these concrete steps in this process. And in here, you see in the middle, this is a, a domain A core competency, which is recognizing how addict brain altered past thoughts and behaviors. What happens is the patient regularly evaluates themselves. So on 10-2-2021, 20, 20, they say, I'm just beginning in these things. And the staff says, yeah, uh, you began the first one, but not the second one. We need to do some more work there. Then you, that is reevaluated at a later date. How are we doing there? The patient says, I think I'm moving along. I'm intermediate. B-I-C means beginning, intermediate, complete. It's not complicated. And it, the, the patient says, um, I, I'm moving along in that first one, but I think I really haven't started that second one. And the staff says, no, actually, I think you've completed both of those. Uh, I think you're doing well on both of those, and let me tell you why. So the patient says, oh, OK, I'm completing something concrete. That creates a concrete process 
in an amorphous blob we call treatment. OK, my time is up. Uh, remember those two concepts. You might be able to help your patients by being clear in your way of seeing the illness. Thank you.